Hi, my name's Alyssa. Thanks for watching today. Before we get started, we wanted to fill you in on our church. Here at Grace, we have a mission and a purpose. Our goal is to help people discover truth, decide on Jesus, demonstrate change, and deploy for others. If you're looking for a church, we would love for you to come be a part of what God is doing here at Grace. You can check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter. We would also like to invite you to one of our Sunday morning services. Check out ohiograce.com for a list of campuses and service times in your area. We have a great time gathering for music, hanging out, and learning about who God is and how that affects our lives. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace. What's up, church? Glad to be here with you this morning. Uh, the last few weeks, we have been going through two tiny little letters that are located in the middle of the New Testament uh, called First and Second Thessalonians. And uh, they're interesting, all right? They're not your normal letters that, uh, that Paul writes, and that's what they are, right? They're letters that this guy named Paul is writing to this church, this new church, this new group of Christians in this huge city called Thessalonica. And uh, these people seem to have questions about this whole Jesus returning thing. And so they, they're like, hey, we want to know more about this, what's going on. Um, in fact, they're kind of freaking out a little bit because, because they're, the church that, that they're in, or the, the church in Thessalonica, they're actually being persecuted and oppressed by the city around them. And now people are starting to get killed. All right, within their church. And so they're like, whoa, Paul, what's going on here? All right, some of these people, you said Jesus was coming back, but now we're starting to get, we're, I mean, we're getting killed over here. And so what's going on? Are those people who have died, like the people that we care for and the love for, our family and friends, are they, are they going to miss it? Or, or what's happened? This doesn't seem to be what you, what you taught us. And so Paul writes these people, and he explains, uh, he explained this. We really looked into this last week. He says, no, 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 you guys don't understand. Those people who have died... Uh, before Jesus returns, he's like, they don't miss out on anything. There's an event that happens before Jesus comes back. And, uh, and the, what we looked at last week is that the real Christians, whenever that takes place, which is still in the future because it hasn't happened yet, uh, the real Christians are caught up or, the, or raptured up or, you know, depending on what video you liked last week, sucked up, you know, vacuumed or whatever, all right? They're caught up in the air to be with Jesus, and uh, the Christians who have actually died, they actually, their bodies get to go first. And then the people who are alive, the Christians who are alive, they get to go. And so Paul writes this last week, what we looked at, and he said, hey, this is great news. All right, we don't have to go through anything that's going to happen afterwards. He's coming back for us. He still loves us. He didn't forget. He's not going, oh, wait, did I have something to do? No, that's not what's going on. And so someday, what the Bible teaches is that the church will be taken. And the question is, then what? What happens after that? What's going on after that? So um, let me just say this. Today's going to be a little complicated. I'm going to be throwing out a lot of information. It's going to kind of be like class, okay? So real quick, I just want to say sorry for that. By the way, I'm not saying sorry for the Bible or what God is telling us. What I'm saying sorry for is my feeble attempt to teach it. Does that make sense? We're all on the same page here. All right, it's going to be it's, it's some complicated stuff, and we're going through a lot of stuff here today. Um, if you're new here, you're going to be listening to some of the, thing, the things that we're going to be talking about, and you're going to be going, this is weird. And I just want to say up front and say, yeah, it is. I already know that. We're all on the same page here. It is really weird, okay? It's stuff that we've never experienced before. It's stuff that we don't think about that often, even as Christians. We're like, yeah, God can do anything, but oh, that's weird. You know, we still think that. Um, just because it's weird doesn't mean that it's not true, and this is what God tells us is going to happen, so this is true, um, and, so, and so that's what we're going to be going through today. So, you guys good? We ready? We're on the same page here? Yeah. All right, all right, try to stay focused in, you know, in See what happens. Okay, so uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. Here's, let's start. Okay, 
He says, about the times, this is Paul writing to these new Christians. He says, about the times and the seasons, brothers and sisters. He says, you do, not need a, you do not need anything to be written to you. He's like, hey, I've already explained all this to you. Okay, when I was with you and Paul was actually the guy who started this church, he's saying, remember, I already taught you guys this. And then he says, for you yourselves know very well that the day of the Lord will come. Now, real quick, just to, just actually, he says, the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. Now, the day of the Lord... When he says this, and what we see within the Bible is when God talks about the day of the Lord, this isn't a a literal 24-hour period, okay? What it is is Paul is specifically talking about Jesus coming back, and the day of the Lord refers to, okay, a period of time where God deals with evil in the world directly and, and dramatically. Does that make sense? Okay, so God's dealing in a specific way that he's not dealing with, with the world right now, and uh, he's really going to deal with the, with the evil in the world directly and dramatically, and it's a period of time, not 24 hours, you know, in a day. So think about it. Like right now at the second, God is sitting on the, in the throne room of God, sitting on his throne. He's got, the Bible tells us he's got angels that are constantly singing to him, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And he's constantly being worshiped and everything around him is perfect and he's infinitely holy, infinitely righteous, and he's infinitely powerful. And then here on earth, his own creation, his own creation that he created, that he loves, openly and unapologetically degrades him and criticizes him. And it seems like he's, he does nothing. I mean, think about it that way. See, Paul, what he's referring to is that's going to end someday, as it should. That is going to come to an end. And, uh, and the end of the world in times this is kind of where we, you know, get into this. Um, it's going to kind of look like this. So Jesus' first coming, that happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born in, uh, you know, in Bethlehem. This Christmas, Christmas, he lived for about 33 years. Uh, we as humans put him to death. And on that cross, he paid for everything that we've ever done wrong. This is God's whole plan for mankind and for rescuing, rescuing us and forgiving us from ourselves. Okay, so um, he, the, when Jesus comes back after he's resurrected from the dead, he starts this thing called the church, okay? The church wasn't my idea. It wasn't somebody's idea 2000, or 1,000 years ago. This was Jesus's thing. This is what Jesus wanted to do. And basically, the church is not a building, okay? It's not something that you do. The church is a group of Christians that come together and do life together, Okay, that's what, that's what we here at Tiffin Grace, we are supposed to be. That's, you know, we're not supposed to be sitting at home all week. We come for an hour every week and sit here in our same seat and we talk, wave to the same people and smile and we leave. Okay, we're supposed to be doing life together. That's why we always try to get people to, to, to come to do stuff. Okay, so that's the church age that Jesus started. Now, nobody knows how long the church age is going to be. We're still in it. This is still happening. So it's about 2,000 plus years, because I know it's at least 2,000 years or so. Well, when that comes to an end is when God pulls the church and he takes the church from the earth. That's what we commonly call, we talked this last week, we talked about this last week, uh, the rapture, where we are literally, Paul says, caught up. Well, the rapture, soon after the rapture, comes the day of the Lord, okay? And the day of the Lord is right here, okay? It encompasses what the Bible calls the seven years of tribulation, all right, which we'll get into that, and Jesus' second coming that happens way at the end of that. Does that make sense? So you got seven years. So the day of the Lord is not 24 hours. The day of the Lord is like seven plus-ish years. Does that make sense? Not less, but maybe more. Okay. So that's the day of the Lord that Paul here is referring to. And this shows up in the Old Testament. This shows up throughout the New Testament. This shows up all over the Bible. So um, that's, that's what's going on here. So the Christians think about it, are gone. They raptured up. It, it, you know, they're, they're, they're not here anymore. What's going to happen when that happens? Okay, that's the first event that kind of ushers in the day of the Lord. Um, it's going to be chaotic, right? I mean, it's going to be crazy. The whole earth is going to be in a panic. I mean, I was looking up this, this week trying to figure out, like, what experts, how many Christians there are on the planet, like, currently right now. You know, what, what's that look like? And a lot of experts say there's, like, 2.5 billion Christians on the planet right now, I personally would probably say, well, it's probably maybe half that or something. Um, you know, just thinking out loud, just because you say a Christian doesn't mean that you truly have a relationship uh, with Jesus. And so let's say a billion people just disappear. 
I mean, you think COVID was crazy and there was lockdowns and people were going nuts and leaders taking advantage. You know, like think about this. A billion people are just gone. Like the whole earth is going, it's just going to be a mess. And so really, I feel like that kind of sets the stage for what's about to happen. And we don't know how long after, but soon after the day of the Lord begins. It might be immediate, might be a few years, we don't know. But the day of the Lord begins, and it's going to be right around that time period. And what Paul says is that no one's going to be ready. That's what he calls it. He says it's going to be like the day of the Lord is going to come, he says, like a thief in the night. Like if someone is going to rob your house, this is the point that tra- Paul's trying to get, a- get across to us. If someone's going to rob your house, they're not going to come in while you're sitting on your couch eating Cheetos. You know what I mean? Watching TV. All right. They're going to come when either you're asleep or you're not there. They're going to come when you are not ready. That's how the day of the Lord's going to show up. People are going to be figuratively asleep. All right, caught off guard, no one's going to be ready. And so this is going to be a big deal, and it's going to come suddenly. Um, in verse 3, he says, when they say peace and security, interesting, how many times have you heard from a leader or the world or a politician, hey, peace and security, all right, this is what we're going to vote for me, you know, this is what we're going to offer you, this is what everybody's about, this is what everybody wants. We want peace, we don't want to be at war, and we want security, and we want to, you know, our freedoms and be able to do our own thing. And so, same thing back, you know, in the future, not back then, then, or yeah, for then, I don't know, whatever. He says, when they say... Peace and security, right? When all the world leaders are going, hey, this is what we're going to offer you. I know a billion people are gone, but, but we're going we're gonna to get this thing back on track. He says, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Now, it's interesting to me that Paul relates the day of the Lord to a woman giving birth. Me, personally, I've never had to experience that, okay? And I will never have to, and I'm very thankful for that, um, but I hear it hurts, okay? I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room that can attest that uh, it does actually hurt a lot. Um, on our third child, so Lizzie, this is basically two years ago, um, we were at home, and, uh, and, and it was getting close to the due date, and Kate, you know, I like walk in the room, she's like crumpled on the ground in our living room, and she's like, ah, you know, I'm like, what's happening? You know, or, are you... You better not be giving birth here, you know? Like, my worst nightmare, by the way, is delivering a child on my carpet in my own house. You know, it's just like, oh, I, it, yeah, just not good. So, um, so I'm like, what's going on? She's like, I'm okay. I don't know what it is, but I'll be all right. And I'm like, okay. Like 20 minutes later, I come back. She's like, ah, uh, you know, I'm like, what's happening? You know, and she's, and I don't know. I don't know what to do. You know, she's like, it's okay, but I don't think anything's wrong. I don't know, you know, those, yeah, whatever. And so then I come back like a third time and she's like, st- she's like crumpled on the stairs now. I'm like, all right, we're going to the hospital. We're going to check this thing out. She's like, no, it's okay. You know, I think this is just what's going, like we're experts now because we've gone through two births already at that point, you know, so it's like, we got this in the bag, but, and those all came late, we had to, like, schedule those, which is nice, you know, Um, but uh, this one wasn't like that, and so I'm like, all right, well, get in the car, you know, and so I, you know, we load her up in the car, and I don't know if that sounds right, but you get, you know, we're like, I walk her to the car, and, uh, and we get in there, we drive to the hospital, we get to the hospital, I get her, like, a, um, a, Oh, what's it called? Come on. Yeah, wheelchair. What's wrong with me? All right. Get her in the wheelchair. We go up to the room, and the, and the doctor takes a look. The doctor's like, you are having a baby. And then 45 minutes later, we have a kid, okay? It happened quick. And I was like 45 minutes to an hour away from delivering that baby in our house. And so that freaks me out, man. Uh, but, uh, but Paul, this is what Paul's pointing at. Paul's like, hey, you know how it is when, when labor starts, right? Number one, it's very painful, and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. Like, the baby's coming, okay? It's coming. It's going to get worse before it gets better in that sense. He's saying that's how the day of the Lord will be. And everybody around, everybody here on earth at that point is kind of going to be like Kate and I. We're going to be like, is this real? I don't know. What should we do? We're not going to be ready for it. No one's going to be ready. There's nothing, but, there, but he's saying there's nothing you could do to stop it or delay it. In fact, he says there is no escape. And what comes? Where are they, what's there no escape from? He says sudden destruction. 
He says, that's what's coming. And nobody seems to have a clue. Now, Paul really doesn't go into detail about what happens here. But it's interesting that Jesus did. Okay? Jesus himself. So God himself. Um, There's one time where Jesus and his disciples, they're... They are uh, at the temple in Jerusalem. They're doing their thing, and it's evening, and so they leave the temple. And the temple in Jerusalem is like on top of a, of a hill, if that makes sense. It's at the highest point. And so they walk over to the next hill, which is called the Mount of Olives. And so they're sitting on the Mount of Olives. They're overlooking the city of Jerusalem. They're overlooking the temple, and the sun's setting. It's probably a really nice, really nice sight. And so they're sitting there, and the disciples go over to Jesus. They're like, hey, Jesus, so question for you. Um, so this whole end of the world stuff, like the end, what does that look like? And so they start asking him some questions about this. And so they say, they say, hey, tell us. Like, Jesus, what's going on? Why are you keeping this from us? Tell us, when will these things happen? These things that you're all always talking about. And what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Remember, these guys think that th- what's going to happen is um, they're going to be, like Jesus is going to usher in a kingdom at that point, and they're going to overthrow the Roman Empire. Israel is going to be a nation on the map again, and Jesus is going to be the king. It's going to be awesome. That's not exactly at all what happens. So, so Jesus had other plans. He says, so Jesus replied to them. He says, watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name saying, hey, I'm the Messiah. I'm the new Jesus, and they will deceive many. He says, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars, and you're going to see that you're not, he says, see that you are not alarmed. Like, don't be afraid, because these things must take place, but the end, it's not yet. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. It's going to be crazy, and these events, he says, are the beginning of labor pains. See, it's interesting. He's using the same words to describe what's going to happen. He's like, it's like labor pains. See, Jesus is saying, hey, these things will be signs until the end is near. And he starts listing them off. Did you catch that? He's like, number one, there's going to be wars. Number two, there's going to be rumors of wars. Number three, people are going to be claiming to be me. And people are going to be claiming to be a prophet. People are going to be claiming to be a, a savior. All these, like, religions are going to be doing this and that. He talks about there's going to be famines and there's going to be earthquakes. By the way, does that sound familiar? Like, turn on your TV. Watch the news. This is the kind of stuff that's been happening for like years, all right? We hear about this stuff all the time. It's like you can list this stuff out and go, check, 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 check. Okay, all of those are checked. It's towards the end. But Jesus has not done it. In the next verse, he says, then they will hand you over to be persecuted, and they will kill you. All right? That's not happy news, (laughs) right? Um, Here in our little bubble of the history of humanity and in this place, okay, at this time and place where we happen to be in the United States of America, um, we don't experience this at all. But throughout the world, like the reality of it, we live in such comfortable, nice, cute little lives, right? But in the reality, the world is experiencing this all the time. In fact, every year, hundreds of thousands of Christians are being killed, are being slaughtered because of their belief in Jesus. We just don't see it. We don't hear about it because our news, nobody talks about it, all right? And it's not happening here, so, so there's not, you know, but th- this is, like, real. Like, this is what's going on right now. It just doesn't touch us in our lives. But this is happening. He says, you will be hated by all nations because of my name. He says, then many will fall away. And because of that, and because people are getting killed, they will betray one another. They're going to hate one another. And many false prophets, they're going to rise up. And then they're going to deceive many. And people are going to start following them. And that's not good because lawlessness will multiply. The love of many will grow cold. People will start loving themselves. They're going to stop loving others like, like what I've commanded them to do. He's saying, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. He says, this good news of the kingdom, okay, what Jesus did on the cross or what he was about to do here when he's writing this or here when he's saying this on the cross um, for us that we can have hope and we can have forgiveness. He's saying that good news of the kingdom will be proclaimed in all the world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Now this in my opinion, is one thing that I don't feel like we can fully check off the box. Now, if we look at nations as a whole, Jesus is saying every nation, like the good news or what we call the gospel or this, this, the news that Jesus died for us, that's to, be, that's to be preached or that's to be taught in every nation before the end comes, okay? And 
I would say if we go by nation, yeah, that's happened. But I think this is even more specific. I think this, is, um, this could easily be more people group, okay? And so some nations, a nation might have like 50 different people groups in it, and uh, especially like overseas and stuff. And so um, I think what Jesus is, is talking about specifically is, hey, every people group needs to hear this stuff, and every people group needs to hear this good news about what I'm doing before the end comes. Now, where are we at on that? Man, we are so close. Many Bible translators will predict or have, a, they have this goal and they predict that uh, the Bible will be translated into every language left uh, by the year 2025. So that's only like three years away. And the Bible's gonna be done. Like this is happening right now. Like right now. And so all this needs to happen that Jesus is talking about before the day of the Lord that Paul is talking about begins. Now, God gives us a glimpse of what will happen in those days. And we get this in the, in the book of Revelation. The kind of the book of Revelation goes like this. Uh, there's this guy named John. John was actually one of Jesus' Jesus's disciples. Actually, John was sitting there with Jesus on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem. John may have been the one asking Jesus this question of, hey, you know, what's gonna happen? Hey, tell us. Like, why are you leaving us in the dark or what's gonna happen? Give us more detail. We wanna know about the end. Okay, John's one of those guys who's sitting there with Jesus. And so years later in John's life, he's an old man. Uh, he's been exiled by the Roman government. He's living on this island called the island of Patmos. And John is sitting there, and I don't know, he's doing his normal thing one day. He's eating his cereal, uh, drinking his coffee, and reading the newspaper, doing whatever, whatever he's doing. And uh, bam, he's in the presence of God. All right, it's crazy. We don't quite know how that happened or what that looks like, but he just tells us that's what was going on. He was doing his own thing, and he's suddenly in the presence of God. And John, who wrote the book of John, yeah, he, God keeps it complicated for us, you know. Um, John, who wrote the book of John, and the book of John, by the way, is just an account of Jesus' life. John, who wrote that, um, throughout his, his book, he refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. Kind of funny, right? Like, hey, my name's John. I'm the disciple who Jesus really loved. Not like Peter and Thomas and, you know, all these other guys. So that's what John refers to himself. And so we can assume that John and Jesus, and John was part of the, the inner three, and, and John and Jesus did a lot of stuff. So they were like, in, in a sense, like, like best friends in that, in that arena, although Jesus is God, so that's a little different. So John, just think about this, appears in the throne room of God, and somebody starts talking to him, John says, and he's behind him. And so John turns around and he sees Jesus, his friend, from long ago. And when John turns around and sees Jesus, he doesn't go, oh, Jesus, what's up? Hey, how'd I get here? What's up? He doesn't, you know, give him a high five or anything like that. He doesn't do that. He turns around and he sees a white-haired, fiery-eyed, glowing skin, shining face of Jesus. And John tells us that he falls down on the ground like a dead man. And then Jesus reaches over to him. He says, don't be afraid. He says, don't worry. Don't, don't be afraid. I want you to see what's going to happen. And I want you to write this stuff down. All right? I want you to tell people. I want you to write this down. And so John watches and this is a glimpse that God has given us saying, hey, this is what's going to happen in the future. And John's there, and, uh, and, and that's where we get this. So Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. And this is talking about the day of the Lord. So Paul doesn't go into detail, but John sure does. All right. So he says, then I saw on the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides, sealed with seven seals. Now, we get this, maybe we don't understand so much, so let me explain this real quick. Um, back in the day, especially in this time, what a king would do, or in this case, an emperor, is when they wanted to write something to somebody else, they would write it on a scroll, they would roll it up, and then they'd get some hot wax, they'd put it on the, you know, where the, where the papers meet, and then they would have a ring that only the Caesar, only the king would have. And so they would put that ring into the wax, the wax would harden, and that would ensure two things. Number one, that this letter or these words are actually from the king uh, because it's got his, his, his seal on it, but it's also, it hasn't been opened and nobody else has read it and nobody else has altered it. Does that make sense? Okay. So Paul, or not Paul, John looks over and there's this scroll that is sealed with seven different seals. It says, and I saw a mighty angel proclaim with a loud voice. He says, hey, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? 
But no one in heaven or on earth or even under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look in it. Crazy, right? Okay, what, what's that all about? And so John said, I cried and I cried. And because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or even to look in it. They couldn't even see in it. He says, then one of the elders said to me, he says, hey, don't cry. Look, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Real quick, all right, this gives us the idea of, and this isn't like a physical lion, okay, but it gives us the idea of someone who's kind of like a lion. This is like the Aslan, you know, uh, Narnia look where you picture this lion, like, like this, you know, man walking in who's got the, the courage of a lion and the power of a lion and the ferocity of a lion and like the danger of a lion coming in with like Satan's head going, hey, drop, got it, done, took care of that. Like that's the idea, like he's conquered. Like this guy is a conqueror and someone that you do not mess with. And so the elder, as John's like crying, like no one can open up the scroll, what's gonna happen? This elder comes to him, he says, hey, don't cry, don't worry. You got the lion from the tribe of Judah who's the root of David who has conquered everything. He's gonna help us out. Like he's the one who is able to open this thing up and we're gonna see what's in there. And so he says he's conquered so that he's open, open, or he is able to open the scroll and even its seals. And so John keeps looking. He says, then I saw one like a slaughtered lamb standing in the midst of the throne. Not what you're picturing. What happened to the whole lion thing? See, Jesus came first as a servant to be slaughtered. And that's what we did. We slaughtered him. But God had other plans because on that cross, he paid for everything that we've ever done wrong. God poured out his wrath and his punishment that we rightly deserve on himself, on Jesus. And so John's describing this, not that this is an actual lamb, no. He describes this person who's coming, who's beat, who's bruised, who's bloody. He's a bloody pulp of a man. And he looks like a slaughtered lamb that is just standing there in the midst of the throne in front of everybody, in front of these angelic beings, in front of these elders, in front of, you know, God the Father. Every, he's, he's there, and, and he, he's looking at him. He's like, that's not what I pictured. What happened to this whole lion thing? And then it says, he went and he took the scroll out of the right hand of the one seated on the throne. And when Jesus does this, everyone, uh, the Bible, John tells us the angels, the people, there's some like beasts there, some crazy stuff, they're there. They all start screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs saying, hey, worthy is the lamb. Not the lion, the lamb. And Jesus begins to open the seals which are connected to things happening on earth during the seven years of tribulation or the day of the Lord. And so I don't have time to go through all this in detail, uh, but what I do want to do is at least tell you what happens. Does that make sense? All right, so there's a lot of things in here that you're like, well, I don't think that's possible or, or that doesn't sound right. But uh, for almost every single one of them, in fact, I think for every one of them, there's like scientific evidence of why this can happen. In fact, it's interesting to me that you know, throughout the last 2,000 years, it's been the church saying, hey, the end of the world's coming, the end of the world's coming, the end of the world is coming. And now science is like finally caught up in a sense saying, oh, you know, now it's science saying the end of the world. We got global warming. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. You know, an asteroid could come, you know, all this stuff. So it's just interesting to me. I just want to point that out, okay, and not argue about it. Just pointing that out. Okay, so this is what the Bible says uh, happens. Number one, there's going to be a judgment or, let's say, punishment, and it's going to happen in three phases. I got a chart here for you. See if this makes sense. Uh, they don't happen one after another, if that makes sense. It, uh, it happens, they kind of happen together. So you got the seals, you got the trumpets, and you got the bulls. Basically, there's seven sets of things that happen on earth. The church is gone. This is, happens to the people that are on earth. Um, during the seventh seal... You have the seven trumpets that happen during that. And during the seven trumpets or during the seventh trumpet, you got the seven bulls that happen during that. So basically, if you can kind of view this in your mind, um, this means that it's going to get progressively worse. It doesn't get easier. It starts off okay, and it gets progressively worse. And, um, and, is, and at the end, it's going to be all out terrible. So this is where we're at. Um, Jesus, he's standing there in heaven. He opens up the first seal. And what we see is that a world leader steps on the scene. And he actually brings peace. 
This, by the way, is what the Bible calls the Antichrist, which we'll be talking a whole lot about next week. So he brings peace. And it's interesting to me that this whole tribulation period is supposed to be like the worst that the world has ever seen. It doesn't begin violently. It begins with peace. And this world leader, he's the one that brings that in. But that peace doesn't last for very long because then Jesus opens up the second seal and that peace is taken away and war breaks out on the earth. And so, again, this is something that, that we're just looking, Jesus saying, hey, this is what happens, okay? So war breaks out on the earth and then Jesus undoes the third seal and there's famine in the land. Um, and so, there, you know, that's either a lack of rain or whatever, but that causes hyperinflation, the Bible says, on food. And so it, you think COVID was bad and you go to the store today and you're like, I got to pay, you know, this much more on food. Are you kidding me? This inflation. You know, I've heard some of you guys complain, all right? You know, gas prices, what? you know, I get it. I totally, I'm, I'm with you. But this is like hyperinflation. Like this is nothing compared to what it's going to be during this day. The Bible says people are like selling everything that they own just for a loaf of bread so they can survive for the next day. I mean, I mean, this is like terrible, terrible stuff. And, uh, and this is something that we've never seen before. And then Jesus unlocks the fourth seal and one-fourth of the population on earth, they die through a multiple, uh, m- multiple ways. They die from war, from famine or lack of food, sickness. The Bible says, and even wild animals. Now that, you know, at first I'm thinking, like, what's that mean? Like, there's lion, tigers, and bears that run around. They're, like, mauling people, or the zoos open up. You know, what's, like, they break out. What, what's going on? This could be something as simple as rats, okay? Something small, you know, that carrying diseases. By the way, human, throughout human history, like, something, I'm just using rats as an example. I don't know if that's it, okay? But throughout human history, you know, <laughs> rats have probably killed more people than any other, any other animal just because they carry diseases and they spread like wildfire. So um, Europe has had to deal with that many times throughout the you know, last thousands of years. So anyway, it could be something as simple as that. Then Jesus unlocks the fist seal and, and the Christians are then killed. Now some of you guys, you're like, wait, what? What do you mean Christians? I thought the Christians were gone. You said they were raptured up. You said they were caught up or sucked up like a vacuum. You said they were gone. What's, what's going on with that? Well, after the rapture happens, there's literally zero Christians on earth, but for at least a short period of time, I don't know how long, as long as it takes for the first person to go, that may have been the rapture, a billion people just disappeared, I'm giving my life over to Jesus. And so at this point um, in time, there's been a bunch of people who have given their lives over to Jesus. I mean, the Bible's still here. Churches are starting to spring up. Uh, All this bad stuff is happening. And people are starting to give their lives over to Jesus again. But at that point in time, the Christians start to get slaughtered because they refuse to worship this world leader that we call, that the Bible calls the Antichrist. So they start getting wiped off the map. In the sixth seal, um, the world, there's worldwide disasters. An earthquake happens on the earth, and the sun is blocked off, and the moon turns reddish. I remember, you know, a few years ago, everybody's freaking out about the, the blood moon. This is where they're kind of getting that. Um, and so the moon turns reddish, and, and fiery rocks fall from the sky. So let's, let's assume those are meteorites. I think that's pretty, um, pretty safe to assume, assume. And the Bible tells us that people start hiding in caves. Well, during the seventh seal, Jesus opens this thing up, and there's silence in heaven, John says, for about half an hour. And I think, I don't know why this is, but my guess is that I think heaven is shocked about what's about to happen. The Bible says an angel then hurls a fireball or let's, at the earth, or let's assume that's a meteorite, and it causes an earthquake, and it causes a global storm, not just like your little storm that is here one day and is gone another. This is a global storm, something that had never, ever happened before. And then the trumpets start. All right, the first trumpet, hail and fire fall from the sky, and one-third of the earth is burned up, and one-third of the plants are gone. And the second trumpet sounds, and a meteorite falls into the ocean, and one-third of the ocean animals die, and one-third of the ships, um, ships are gone. And again, there's a bunch of science behind this, like if something were to, like a meteor were to hit the ocean, like the Atlantic Ocean, I mean, it would wipe out both coasts, like on Africa and, and Europe, and then the whole eastern seaboard of the United States, New York, Boston, Miami, could easily be gone if something like that happened. 
heavens, um, the third trumpet, uh, the meteor fall, meteorite falls, and one third of the rivers and lakes, the fresh water, are turned poisonous when that happens, and many, many people die from drinking the water. And then the fourth trumpet sounds, and the sun, the moon, and the stars, they turn dark one third of the time, and the, and the seasons are just instantly gone. It's kind of interesting to me that, like, like, you know, we're worried about, like, global warming, and, and I'm not saying that's not happening, or I'm not saying anything about that, really, so don't come up and talk to me afterwards. But I'm saying, <laughs> it's a hot button issue. I'm saying, um, we're worried, like, a couple of degrees happening, you know? This is, like, global stuff here that's happening. This is, like, big. And the season here, the seasons are, like, instantly gone. There are no seasons anymore. It's all, it's, the, the earth is just messed up. And then someone in heaven, they shout out, they say, woe to those living on the earth, basically saying, hey, you guys think this is bad. It's about to get way, way worse. And then the fifth trumpet sounds, and the abyss is opened up, and the demons are let out. Now, what the heck is that? Okay, this is going too far. How many guys, uh, we've talked about this here before, remember the time where Jesus, they crossed over the, the Sea of Galilee, he's with his disciples, they get to the, to, you know, to the other side, and there's this naked guy who comes running up to him, and he's, he's, a, um, you know, he's got demons in him and stuff, and um, you guys remember that story? And they're like, and they run up to Jesus and say, what are you doing here, Jesus? I know who you are. And Jesus is like, shut up. You guys remember that? Okay, some of you. All right, good. Um, well, this happens. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Go, go read it. Um, but, uh, but this guy comes up, and Jesus, remember, he, he like, interacts with the, with the demons. And first he says, what's your name? And the demon says, well, um, it's Legion. There's a bunch of us in here. And Jesus is like, okay. Um, and then they start begging him. They're saying, Jesus, please don't send us down to the abyss. Please, 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 please don't send us down to the abyss. Send us into over those. There's a, there's a herd of pigs over here. Send us into them. And Jesus says, okay. And they go, and they rush down the water, and they all die. Remember that? Okay. So it's interesting. These demons, what are they worried about? They're worried that Jesus, who's God, will send them into this place that the Bible calls the abyss. And, uh, and, and they're worried about that. And so what we actually find out, actually I was just reading this in First Peter in my own personal devotions this morning as I was reading the Bible myself. Um, there's this place that the Bible refers to as the abyss, but this place that uh, holds um, Demons, which are just fallen angels, that have done stuff so bad from before Noah's time. Like, before Noah and before God destroyed the earth by flood, God, there were some demons that did stuff so bad that God was like, you guys can't be here. And I'm taking you, and he throws them into this, like, holding tank, if that makes sense. And so that's where those demons were worried that Jesus might send them. Um, but here, at the end of the world, or at the end of time, that holding tank is opened up. And those demons are allowed to go free. The Bible does say that, G that John does tell us that God doesn't allow them to kill anyone. And so instead they just torture people and people will beg to die and they won't be able to die. And this happens for about five months. And then the sixth trumpet happens where one third of mankind die and there's fire and there's smoke. And this could be a nuclear, this could be, you know, uh, bombs, this could be other bombs, this, this could be a meteorite, this could be anything like that. And I feel like us as Christians, like we automatically start to feel bad for these people. We're like, hey, surely these people would be running to God, right? Like that's how, that's how I'm thinking as I'm going through this. I'm like, this is really horrible stuff. But then we read, and John tells us in Revelation 9, it says, the rest of the people who were not killed by these plagues, they did not repent of the works of their hands to stop worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze, and stone and wood, which, by the way, it cannot even see, hear, or walk, okay, like an animal. It says, and they did not repent of their murders, their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. These people do not care what God has to do or anything about God. Then the seventh trumpet happens and another global storm and earthquake and hail and all this stuff happens on the earth. Then we got the bulls, okay, the last chunk of seven. Um, the first bull, this, this kind of signifies like God pouring out his wrath or pouring out his righteous punishment, okay? It's not unrighteous, it's righteous, all right? These people deserve it, all right? Just like we deserve it. He's pouring it out on the, on the earth. And so first, there's this epidemic uh, that covers the globe, all right? Kind of familiar. Uh, but these people develop painful sores like, just all over their body. And then the second bowl is all the sea life dies after that. And then the third bowl is poured out where all the fresh water, where the rivers and lakes, they all turn bad where you can't drink it. At first, it was a third. Now it's all of them. And then the fourth 
North Bowl is where the sun becomes too hot and people, they go outside and, and they can't stay out there without being covered, okay, because it's just so hot out there. And the Bible, John specifically says that when this happens, the people start cursing God even more. And then the fifth bowl he pours out and the sky turns dark and these people, they still refuse to repent, John says. And then the sixth bowl is poured out and the Satan, Satan and the demons, they gather all the nations and all the people left together, and then the seventh bowl is poured out where there's a huge earthquake, something that's never happened in the history of the earth, where mountains literally disappear and islands are literally gone. Then there's 100-pound rocks falling from the sky, and it's almost like God is reconfiguring the earth to, pre, to the pre-flood condition, back to when it used to be perfect in preparation of the coming of the king. The Bible says when this happens, the people curse God even more, and Jesus returns. Now, we're going to be talking about that in the next couple of weeks, but what Paul's referring to is these seven years, and, uh, and this is what he talks about when he's talking about the day of the Lord. Again, it's a period of time where God deals with evil in the world directly and dramatically, and it sounds intense, and it sounds terrible, and, but it, and, and all this stuff is so big and it's so bad that I feel like it's beyond our ability to imagine it. But the good news is that we as Christians, we don't got to be afraid because we won't be here. Hallelujah for that. You know what I'm talking about? Paul actually, actually reminds him of this. He says, back to 1 Thessalonians. He says, but you brothers and sisters, guys, he says, you're not in the dark for this day to surprise you like a thief. You're not going to be, you're going to be, you know this is coming. For you are all children of light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or the darkness. He's like, hey, you aren't one of those people. All right, we are not a part of this because we are gone and we are out. In fact, just a few verses later, he says, for God did not appoint us to wrath. God doesn't want to punish us. That's not God's plan is, hey, I'm going to punish them so bad. It's going to be so, it's not what God wants. He wants us to have salvation. He wants to save us instead to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're only able to do that because of what Jesus did on that cross 2,000 years ago, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, remember we talked about this the last couple weeks, whether we are alive when this happens or dead when this happens, we may live together with him. Therefore, this is what we are to do, okay, as Christians in this room. He says, encourage one another and build each other up as you are already doing. So what? So what's the big deal about all this? Okay, this sounds crazy to us. He says, so knowing this, encourage and build each other up. All right, this is great news for us. But it also gives us, we don't got to be here for this, but it also gives us a sense of urgency, meaning that the idea of people that we love, that we care about going through that, man, that should bother us. Like, that should, that should not sit well in here with us. And so really, this pushes us and motivates us to spread the word about Jesus and the hope that we can have in him and the forgiveness that we can have through him. It's the honest truth is we are living in the last of the last days. That doesn't mean we worry about it. This is to be encouraging to us. Because if our lives are cut here short, it's only us, this only gain for us. I mean, we get to spend more time with Jesus. And it's gonna be awesome. And that's what's in our future. Cool to think about. Let's pray. God, we thank you for these words and thank you for just telling us what happens. And I get, I mean, it's hard for us to imagine, it's hard for us to picture, mostly because this is stuff we've never even heard about or thought about in our entire life and we've never experienced, but God, you warn us that this is happening. We ask that you would help, that these words would help motivate us to reach the people that are in our lives for you. That's what you command us to do, Lord, and that's what matters. And God, we, um, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for caring about us. We thank you for dying for us when you didn't have to. God, we thank you for that. Lord, we, uh, we ask that you'd help us as we go in this week just to to be a light to the people around us and help us to love like you've called us to love.
Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching, and we hope to see you here next week at Grace.